we're going to pray as we begin. Lord, as we turn now to your precious word, I just pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would take this passage of scripture that we're going to look at and apply it to our hearts. Help us to take something away from this message that will really encourage and help us in our Christian lives. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. After each election, and I believe there'll be one again at the end of this year, the winning party uh, comes uh, and uh, the, the leader of the winning party is sworn in as Prime Minister by the Governor General, who is the Queen's representative in New Zealand. And then each of the ministers in the new government is also sworn in um, uh, in the presence of the Prime Minister and other dignitaries. And the, each minister is given what is called a warrant of appointment that is signed individually by the Governor General. And it's a solemn charge. They are given the solemn charge to fulfill the duties, to carry out the duties of their portfolio, to serve the people of New Zealand. And in the passage we've just read, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul gives the solemn charge, a warrant of appointment, if you like, uh, to Timothy. It's a solemn charge, and that's our first point for today. In verses 1 and 2, Paul says, In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Let's look just for a moment at in whose presence this charge is given. For what reason Timothy is given this charge? You know, like the governor general, representing Her Majesty the Queen, gives the Prime Minister and his ministers their charge. So here, Paul, the Apostle, is giving Timothy a charge. And it's from a much higher authority, much higher authority than Her Majesty the Queen. Paul says, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead. So he's giving him an, a very, very important charge, and he's, uh, he's representing not just the Queen, but the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. It's in the presence of God and of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that Paul commissions Timothy. It's an awesome, it's a holy calling. I, I was showing you this one a little ahead of time. The oath of office administered by the Chief Justice in the United States when the new president is inaugurated. But you know when Timothy uh, gives that charge, that commission, it's not in the presence of the Chief Justice. It's in the presence of the judge of all the earth of Jesus Christ. A few, moment, a few weeks ago we looked at, at Revelation chapter 20 and we saw there it mentions the great white throne on which God uh, dispenses absolutely perfect justice. And it says here in this verse, Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead. Jesus is God. He is our judge. And it's in his presence, the judge of all the earth, that this amazing commission is given to Timothy. And um, it's an incredibly serious thing. And it's in view also of his appearing. Jesus is coming again. And that call to service is made doubly urgent because we know that time is short. None of us knows when Jesus is coming again. And none of us knows when our own life will end. But we have been given a call, a commission, a charge to serve. And um, time is precious. It's very, very precious. We must be ready for when he comes or when he calls. And the charge is also given in the light of God's kingdom, in the light of his kingdom. This is also important. Nothing is more important than serving in and building God's kingdom. So many of us, we spend all our time and effort building our own kingdoms. There's nothing wrong with trying to build up your business, trying to build up your home, make it nice, and uh, try to build up your career. It's all very good. It's all very good. But let's remember, far more important is, are we building the kingdom of God? Through our work, through our life, are we building the kingdom 
of God. And you know, pastors and churches can be so caught up with building their own, our own little kingdom, our own little church, our own denomination, that we forget God's wider kingdom. We are part of the wider kingdom. And that's what we must do. Not our own petty kingdoms, but let's build the kingdom of God. Let's be concerned about the kingdom of God. You might wonder, how does this apply to me? I'm not a pastor. I'm not working for a Christian organization. How does this apply to me? Well, as we've said many times before, every Christian is called to serve. We've also been given the Great Commission. Every Christian is called to witness for Jesus. In our daily work, our profession, our trade, in our studies if we're a student, and in our office, in our home, that is really the platform. That is the arena in which we serve. We're serving the king. And Jesus gave his disciples that great commission in Matthew 28, which applies to each one of us. It's our warrant of appointment. We have been given a, a really wonderful charge. And we're servants. We're ministers. We're ministers in God's kingdom, in his government. Minister means a servant. It means someone who serves others. Let's look briefly at the charge, the commission that Timothy was given. It is preach the word. Preach the word. That's the first part of the commission. When I was first appointed uh, as the pastor of Mairangi Bay Church about 10 years ago now, I was given the same solemn charge. This passage that we just read was read at our induction service. And I've tried uh, to be faithful to that promise that I made to preach the gospel. And I believe very strongly in this call to preach the word is one of the most solemn and important callings that any man or woman can ever be given. And it is, of course, the primary responsibility of every pastor to preach the word. We're to preach the Bible. We're to teach the word of God, what God has revealed. We're not here to, to teach our own ideas. We are told to, to expound the text, to explain the Bible, to make it plain and understandable, and to make it applicable in the lives of the hearer. We are responsible to do that. Timothy also discovered that the scriptures made him wise to salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. So a preacher, a pastor, is there to preach the gospel, the good news that will lead people to salvation, make them wise for salvation. They will understand the gospel and put their faith in Jesus Christ. That's the purpose of preaching. It's not to, not to waffle on about my opinions or my ideas. We're to preach the word. We're to expound the Bible, not to show how or try to show how clever we are. Our job is not to moralize. It's not to try and persuade people to be good. You know, a lot of people think uh, being a Christian is all about, you know, chen ren wei shan. It's kind of try and persuade people to be good. Isn't that what all religions are doing? That's what I've been told many times. That's what religion is. Well, we're not here to press religion. My job is not to push religion on you, to try and tell you to be good, to try harder. No. My responsibility as a preacher is to point to Jesus, is to point to the living word, to preach from the written word and to point to the living word, Jesus Christ. He's the only one who can change us. He's the only one who can transform us. He's the only one who can save us and give us a hope and a future. Now, again, you might say, what's this got to do with me? I'm not a preacher. I'm not a pastor. I'm not a full-time Christian worker. Well, yes, it may not be your calling to stand behind a pulpit Sunday by Sunday, uh, bringing God's word. It may not be your calling to go in cross-cultural mission. It was my privilege to do that. Warren and, and Doreen, I, I bet they have no regrets that God called them to that. And God may call some of you into full-time ministry in a cross-cultural setting. It's a wonderful, thrilling thing to be called to that. But you know, this might not be your calling. But the same principle is here. Because all of us are called 
to be a witness. And we preach, whether we like it or not, by life as well as by lip. And I love this little song. I've quoted it before, I know. What you are speaks so loud that the world can't hear what you say. They're looking at your walk. Not listening to your talk. They're judging from your actions every day. This is so important, isn't it? As Christians, how we live is how we preach. How we react in situations, how we relate to people, how we do our job, what we say, what we watch, and what we do on the internet, what our leisure activities are, what we spend our money on, how we serve, how we treat others. This is all how we can be a witness communicating the message. Do you know, it's very true, let me see if this will change, here we go. Some people, uh, you are the only Bible some people will read. You may be the only Bible people ever read. They might not pick up this Bible, but they're looking at you, and they're reading you. And so this is why being a Christian is not just coming to church, it's not being religious, it's living. It's living out the Lord Jesus in our everyday lives. It makes sense then that Paul goes on from talking about preaching the word to saying be prepared in season and out of season. Be prepared in season and out of season. We should always be ready, in other words, to be a witness when it's convenient and when it's not so convenient. We must be alert to the opportunities that the Lord gives us. I remember one time I was all checked in for a flight from Chengdu in Sichuan province, flying back to Hong Kong. And with me was a friend uh, who was also flying back to Hong Kong, a British friend. And uh, we were in the crowded waiting room in Chengdu airport. And an announcement came over the, um, came over the uh, spe loudspeaker system and said, because of the heavy fog, all flights will be delayed until further notice. Now, as I said, I was with my British friend, John, and he needed to get a connecting flight in Hong Kong to fly back to the UK. It was quite urgent. And if we were delayed much longer, he would miss that flight. Well, instead of getting all anxious and worried about it, we decided we'd pray. And so John and I sat there in the seat and we said, Lord, you know about the fog. You know about the problem. All the flights canceled. Please um, make a way for us to get back to Hong Kong. And a short while later, I got up and I started chatting to two People's Liberation Army officers who were standing there, all in their smart uniforms, and they were waiting for another flight, you see. And in a natural way, as we talked, it came out that I was a Christian. And they said to me, you're a Christian. They said, we don't believe in God. We're atheists. I said, oh, that's very interesting. I was talking to God just a moment ago. And they said, what? What do you mean you were talking to God? And so I explained that I'd just been talking with my friend about the fog and the, and the, the delay and, and praying that we would be able to leave to head for Hong Kong because of his flight and so on. They, they laughed. They laughed. They said, didn't you hear the announcement? Can't you see the fog? We know Chengdu, and when the fog comes in like this, 100% there'll be no flights. You might as well just relax. And... Do you know that we hardly said that to me? Then the announcement came over the speaker, and it said this. It said, will all those for the Cathay Pacific flight to Hong Kong please proceed to departure? Your flight is ready for boarding. And these, uh, these guys, sort of they, they couldn't believe what they were hearing. And they looked at me, and I smiled, and I waved as we took <laughs> off. <laughs> but, you know, if I got all upset about the fact that, you know, there's a fog, and uh, we've got to get back to Hong Kong, and I was all fussing and, and stamping or walking around, pacing up and down, looking at my watch, I'd have missed watching out for people. And I'd have missed that opportunity that God gave me. 
And even if we'd been delayed, you know, God would have been able to use me in those circumstances as well. We must not fuss. We must be ready to trust God, to look for the opportunities when it's convenient and when it's not so convenient, when we feel like it and when we don't feel like it. We must be ready, you know. And so Paul tells Timothy, when you are in, in season and out of season. But notice what he goes on to say. When you share your faith, when you sh share the good news of the gospel, do it. You sometimes have to correct and rebuke. And, but you must also encourage. You know, correcting and rebuking is not nice. When we correct people for an error or rebuke a wrong behavior, people don't enjoy that. People don't enjoy being told they need to do things differently. You just think of your children when you have to correct them and rebuke them. And sometimes the pastor has to do that. It's not very easy, is it? I'd rather say, oh, everybody's wonderful. No problems. Just carry on, do what you're doing. E -e, and be friends with everyone. No, but sometimes you have to tell people, hey, if you carry on like that, you're going to ruin your life. If you carry on like that, your marriage is going to uh, be destroyed. If you carry on like that, you're going to whatever. We need to be honest with people. Sometimes the truth hurts. And so Paul reminds Timothy, Sometimes you have to correct. Sometimes you have to rebuke. And do it. Don't be afraid. But do it always with a purpose of encouraging, with encouragement. And that's when we, with our children too, when we correct, when we rebuke our children, we must always do it with love. And we must do it with humility. We always, when we give correction, when we give rebuke, we must do it with love and humility to build up, not to tear down, to encourage not to discourage. And so these are wonderful words of advice for anyone wanting to serve the Lord, aren't they? Let's ask the Holy Spirit to help us be more effective as witnesses for the Lord Jesus. And so we come to our second point, and it's our only other point. We've just got two points today. And this is about itching ears. You know what an itch is, don't you? When, when I first got married... Uh, Elizabeth used to wonder, what is he doing? By the bedroom door, uh, he would be going like this against the, the door frame. He'd say, you Andersons, you really are a, it's like monkeys scratching there. What's up? I said, well, it's an itch. And if you would be kind enough, you could give me a nice back scratch and that would sort it out. But we know what an itch is, don't we? You can't reach it. You need someone to help you scratch it. But if, what is an itching ear? What is an itching ear? This is what Paul talks about here. It's actually when somebody wants you to tickle their fancy. They want to feel better. They want you to say something to make them feel better. They want you to tickle their ear. They want you to scratch their itch in their ear. They want to feel comfortable. But sadly, the truth sometimes makes us feel uncomfortable. And Paul warns. He says to Timothy, the time will come Oh yes, there we go. Itching ears. People want to hear what makes them feel good and comfortable, but the truth sometimes makes us feel uncomfortable. Well, Paul says to Timothy, the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want them to hear. Paul speaks of this time when people will not put up with sound doctrine. They want to find teachers who will tickle their fancy, who will give them new ideas and make things much easier. Oh, to be a Christian, this is going to be much easier for you. And sadly, we see this in liberal churches, churches that preach a liberal gospel. They cut out anything that's offensive, and they want people all to be happy. Just keep doing what you're doing, and just believe anything you, be you want to believe, and that's fine. That's what liberal churches, they throw out the word of God, they change the Word of God to suit society. The media does it, of course. The media turns things upside down. On the university campus, you'll find people promoting values that are totally against the Bible. And in society in general, people have these ideas that are completely against what the Word of God teaches. And, um, hang on, where are we? I'm losing power here. Here we go. Um, they, they think they're clever. They think they're smart. They think they're enlightened, but they actually uh, think, you know, that the Bible is out of date, it's irrelevant, and they haven't even read the Bible, and they don't tolerate the truth. Now, I feel sorry for people like that. 
but they want you to tickle their ears. They want, uh, want to follow the, what modern men and women are thinking instead of the clear teaching of the Bible. And sadly, some pastors do this. They try to fit their message to popular culture. They go for the sensational. And they want a version that, of Christianity that is more acceptable, less confrontational to modern man. Now some churches, here we are, I'm losing, I am losing power. Some churches want their pastor. Pastors are so worried about being politically correct that they actually corrupt the gospel. And they emphasize grace. Grace is wonderful. But they emphasize grace and fail to mention repentance. They fail to mention repentance. And they emphasize God's love, but they don't even talk about God's holiness, His justice. They don't want to offend anyone. They don't want to upset anyone by telling them that they are lost and that they need a Savior. And that's what the gospel is all about. Don't water down the gospel, Timothy, says Paul. These people will turn aside. They'll turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. And in Chinese, it's quite interesting because it says, Shen Hua, that's a myth. You add one little character in the middle, Shen De Hua, that's God's word. So myth is Shen Hua. Shen De Hua is a very different thing. And so we must be careful not to turn away from God's word to myths because myths cannot save us. Only the truth saves us. Only the truth can set us free. We need to read and understand the Bible. We need to preach and teach the word of God because this is where we find the truth. Paul tells Timothy, don't be enticed by popular philosophy and modern fashion, the latest fashion. All these false teachers and prophets, they get a big crowd to come and listen to them, but don't feel discouraged. Political correctness should not stop you uh, from preaching and declaring faithfully the truth. You know why some people turn aside to myths. Timothy, Paul says, you're to keep your head. Keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of, a, of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. That is to, to do your, serve as you're called to serve. Keep your head, Timothy. Don't, don't get um, uh, pressured. Think carefully. Don't follow the latest craze. Be sober. Be disciplined. And even if you have to pay a price, even if people criticize you, even if people misunderstand you, keep sharing the good news of Jesus. Be faithful in serving. Be reliable. Be diligent in carrying out the duties of your ministry. Well, again, you might say, how does this apply to me? This is pastors and preachers you're talking about now. They've got to preach the word, right? But what about me? How does this apply to me? Well, you know that as followers of Jesus, every one of us also should be faithful to God's truth. We should hold firm uh, according to God's teachings in the place where we work, in society, in the home. Let's put into practice these truths. Let's keep sharing the gospel. Let's remain faithful. Let's stand up for what's right. And when we're telling others, let's invite them to church. Many of you are doing that. You're serving. You're being faithful. You're fulfilling the duties of your ministry, and that is wonderful. I encourage you to keep doing that. When Pastor Aubrey comes, I encourage you to give him your full support and pull your weight in the various ministries because no pastor can or should try and do everything in the church. The church would fold up if, the, if it was all on the pastor or the pastor's wife. And the staff members, the staff workers in the church cannot possibly do everything that needs to be done. We depend on everyone to be involved. And in fact, um, here we go, here we go again, here we go. We all have a part to play. We all have different gifts because we're part of the body of Christ. We have a part to play. Now, when I say I'm retiring, it doesn't mean that I'm going to stop serving the Lord. I'm only stepping down from being a pastor in the responsible position of pastor. But I believe God's bringing a new and younger pastor like Pastor Aubrey that we're going to see new and exciting adventures. We're going to go on exciting adventures together 
in the church. And there'll still be plenty for me and Elizabeth to do in serving the Lord, both in our church and in the wider context of the kingdom of God. You know, before in Olympic Games, uh, the, 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 the runners take the Olympic torch from one place to another around the country until finally they get to the stadium where the opening ceremony is going to take place. And it's a great honor to be one of those runners running with the Olympic torch on the different stages of the journey. And there comes a time, however, for each runner to pass the torch on to the next runner. And this is what Paul is saying to Timothy. He is passing the torch of responsibility and ministry to a younger worker. And we're going to think about this more in the final message when we come to it in 2 Timothy, which actually Paul read a little bit about it uh, there as well this morning. But if you are a Christian, I want us to remember we all have a solemn charge. We all have this, uh, what do you call it, a commission, this um, warrant of appointment that God has given to each one of us. And my prayer is that we'll be faithful. We'll serve the Lord joyfully. We'll love people. We won't go out there criticizing, running them down, but we'll love them, but we won't compromise. We won't change the message to make people feel happy. Let's ask the Lord to keep us faithful. Ask him to fill us with his Holy Spirit to give, make us effective witnesses where he's placed us, wherever it may be, to be faithful to his word, true to his calling on our lives. Let's pray together, shall we? Lord Jesus, we want to thank you today for the wonderful gospel message, the message that can transform our lives. And I pray for any here this morning who do not yet know you, that they would be able to see that, Lord, to, be, to become believers and followers of the Lord Jesus is not throwing their lives away. They're actually coming into service with the King. They're coming into royal service and they're going to be part of building your kingdom. And I pray for each one of us here today who are Christians that we would just see how wonderful this calling is, how, how, what an awesome privilege it is to serve the King of kings and Lord of lords, to work for his kingdom. And so, Lord, we pray that you'll keep us faithful. Help us not to compromise. Help us not to be afraid because of society around us with such a different view and opinion. Help us to graciously, lovingly share the good news with others. Give us the wisdom, the strength, the courage that we need. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.